It is so nice to see you guys. All right. Well, as Norris was saying, we have an exciting series that we're going to be doing in the life and times of Samuel. And before we begin, I have a disclaimer for you guys. There are a few names in the chapters we're going to look at today, and there are lots of different pronunciations. So we have Hannah, that's the easy one. But then we have Hannah's husband, and I've heard Elkanah, Elkanah, Elkanah. I just want you to know, I'm going to go with Elkanah today. So if that grates you a little bit, I'm sorry, it's my disclaimer. The harder one is Elkanah's other wife. Hannah's his first wife. Elkanah, El Elkanah has another wife. And I've heard Panina, Panina. I've heard panini. <laughs> Paninis are what you buy at Panera Bread, so we're not going to go with panini. <laughs> we're going to go with panina. Okay, so uh, the title of my message, as you can see, is Hannah's New Song, The Sovereignty and Salvation of the Lord. So I really love the the beginning of where we start today. Um, when telling a story, it can be difficult to know where to start. When Leo Tolstoy was 18 years old, he picked up a book written by Russia's revered poet, Alexander Pushkin. And the book that he picked up was Eugene Onegin. And what he found in the opening stanza of that book dropped him directly into a deep family conflict. Tolstoy was pulled in immediately by this literary device. There was no background, there was no character development, there was no leading up to a plot. He was mesmerized by this technique, and he went on to imitate it in his seminal novel, Anna Karenina. The opening line of that book, you, you all might know it, is one of the most quoted in all of literature, and it's this. Happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. The narrator of the book of Samuel, writing somewhere a thousand years before Christ, opens with a very unhappy family in the middle of a very real family conflict. It's a family conflict that is representative of what's happening in Israel on a larger scale. But before we jump into the conflict in Samuel, I wanted to give us some background for the overall series. Samuel is a narrative book. It's comprised mainly of detailed historical prose. And unlike the books of the law, there aren't a whole didactic list of do's and don'ts. There are very, very few instances of poetry in the book. One of the few instances we're going to get in poetry we're actually going to hear today. But basically, throughout Samuel, we get a whole lot of interconnected stories filled with dynamic and sometimes tragic figures. We get Eli, the weak priest, and his two wicked sons. We get Elkanah, the somewhat aloof husband of two wives, godly Hannah, with her womb closed, and Penina, her vindictive rival. We get Samuel, the answered prayer of Hannah's desperate plea, who becomes the last and greatest judge in Israel's history. We get Saul, anointed king by Samuel, but later rejected by the Lord. We get David, also anointed as king by Samuel. David rises to meteoric heights. He's hunted like a wild animal by Saul. He rises to the throne. He falls to sin. He's restored by grace. And through God's promise, provides the line through which Christ, the true and everlasting king of Israel, would come. And that isn't even scratching the surface of intriguing and illustrative characters that we find in the life and times of Samuel. The narrator of Samuel gives us the unmistakable understanding throughout the books that it's God who provides the victories needed to save Israel. And not just victories from aggressive forces coming from the outside, but also from internal self-destruction, moral decline, political upheaval, 
and meltdown right in, the, in their own family units. In terms of setting, 1 Samuel starts at the beginning of the end of the period of Judges. Now, you probably know Judges were leaders that were somewhat sporadically raised up in times of crises to help save Israel from destruction. Eli is the current judge and priest of Israel at the start of our story. Eli is coming right on the heels of Samson, but unlike Samson, Eli is not the recipient of any supernatural strength, and he's certainly not the channel of any miraculous displays. In fact, you could say Eli is, is very weak, as are his sons. The period in which we find ourselves is a difficult and dark one for Israel. The Bible shoots pretty squarely on this point. It says, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. And there was no open vision. Do you get the picture of the spiritual barrenness in Israel? There's no word. There's no vision. There's no unified leadership. Israel is being provoked sorely by her neighbors, the Philistines, and there's internal conflict in Israel. But something miraculous is about to break. The Lord, who is sovereign over the affairs of human history, is going to intervene. He's going to use an inconsequential Hebrew woman to achieve his great purposes for Israel, to show that he listens to the prayers of, cares for, and involves the very smallest and weakest of his faithful. In essence, God is getting ready to do what he does so well. He's going to exalt the humble and bring low the proud. Yes, God is going to raise up a mighty leader through Hannah, one who's going to be called Israel's second Moses, and he's going to do it in a miraculous way. But before we get there, we must begin our story like Pushkin and Tolstoy did in the middle of a family meltdown. Let's pray for our time together as we dig into God's word. Oh Lord, help us today to remember that the race is not given to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. For you order the steps of your people, and you are sovereign over the affairs of man. Sparrow may seem insignificant to us, yet it does not fall to the ground without you knowing it. There's not a hair that you have not numbered, there's not a tear that you have not bottled. Your thoughts toward us are more numerous than the stars in the sky or the grains of sand on the beach. Oh Lord, help us to see that it is really in our weakness that your strength is perfected in us. Help us to be like Hannah, Lord, as we lay our will and desire down at your feet. We don't often know the why of our suffering, but we know that in your hands, you will make something good of it. Please open this word to our hearts that it may change us. In Jesus' name, amen. So as promised, we land pretty much right in the middle of a major family conflict in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1. Let's take a look. There was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jerahim, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuth, an Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and then the name of the other was Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. From the start of the verse, you almost start to get the impression that maybe Elkanah comes from an important family, or maybe he's a significant member of society, but he really isn't. He's just a guy from the hills. <laughs> he's a hillbilly. <laughs> the, 
There's nothing special that commands our attention to this insignificant family of Elkanah's, except perhaps Elkanah's blunder of having two wives. Bad idea. I don't know if you guys grew up with Saturday Night Live, but I did. And I always love Deep Thoughts by Jack Handy. So here's one that I made up for you. Having two wives or girlfriends is never a good idea. But seriously, in Genesis, God says, A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. One, singular, uno, not two, not three. I think sometimes we get the impression that polygamy was an accepted practice for God's people in the Old Testament, but it really wasn't. Whenever polygamy is mentioned in the Bible, it usually involves rivalry, jealousy, scheming. There's all kinds of problems. You really don't have to look much further than the account of Abraham and Sarah and their servant Hagar for the full level of consequence of polygamy. Hannah faces much conflict because of her husband's bad decision. But God is still going to use this ordinary small-town blunderer and his wife Hannah to accomplish great ends. If you read on, verse 2 basically tells us that Penina had children, but Hannah didn't. Scholars think that Hannah was probably Elkanah's first wife, but when she remained childless, Elkanah married Penina. And you, of course, probably know in those days, an abundance of children was considered a blessing, but childlessness was considered a curse. And we definitely get from the overall text that Hannah felt socially cursed and spiritually forgotten. Despite Elkanah's unwise decision to have two wives, he's not an otherwise ungodly or cruel man. Verse 3 tells us that he goes up faithfully year by year to Shiloh with his family to offer sacrifices to the Lord. And he's certainly not without love for Hannah. Let's look at verse 4. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. I read between the lines here with this scripture. I kind of get the feeling that Elkanah's relationship with Penina, Penina, not Panini, Penina is somewhat cold and distant. The relationship is further con- contrasted by the fact that he gives Hannah a double portion and because the verse says that he loved her. Despite Elkanah's demonstrative love, Hannah is deeply grieved, especially because of Penina. Look in verse 6. And her rival, Penina, used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So Elkanah loved Hannah even though the Lord had closed her womb. And Penina provoked Hannah because the Lord had closed her womb. But two times we are told that the Lord is the one who closed her womb. The writer really wants you to get this point because it is the source of major conflict and only God can intervene. The theme of the closed womb is not new. It's used in special times throughout the scripture. There's Sarah, as previously mentioned. There's Rebecca. There's Rachel. There's Samson's mother, Manoah. God uses special childbirths like these to highlight his strength his mercy and grace, and his special calling on the child. And just like in those examples, we the reader understand that the Lord closed Hannah's womb for a special purpose. But Hannah didn't know this. I'm sure she's thinking, what did I do to deserve this? Haven't I been a faithful wife, an honorable woman? Why has God turned away from my cries? Why did he allow this woman in my house to mess up my marriage and then to treat me like I did something wrong? And then 
Verse 7, so it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? You know, um, somewhat ironically, the apex of the conflict is happening as the family is making their annual pilgrimage to Shiloh for the peace offering. Some of you might feel like this describes your Sunday drive to church. (laughs) The whole family is thrown in the car for the Sunday pilgrimage, and everyone starts acting like Penina. Stop! (laughs) So Penina's taunting and jeering is making Hannah's journey anything but peaceful. Year after year, she would have her heart broken all over again. But you know what? This tells me that Hannah had not totally lost hope. She had not become numb or despondently complacent. There was still something here to break. Yes, her hope was deferred. Her spirit was low. But this faithful, godly woman showed up year after year and humbly worshipped her God. And on this particular occasion, it's really all she can do to keep herself together. And she weeps bitterly. Elkanah, in his flaccid attempt, tries to comfort her. Why don't you eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not better to you than ten sons? I've been married for 15 years now. I know a little bit. So I start asking myself, why... Didn't Elkanah say, Hannah, you are better to me than ten sons? That would have been so much better, Elkanah. Why didn't you say that? (laughs) But you see, Elkanah couldn't really say that because she wasn't better to him than ten sons. He went and married someone else and had children with her. So Elkanah is not in any kind of position to comfort Hannah. And as a matter of fact, the extra attentions that Elkanah is giving to Hannah are really provoking Penina, and Penina is becoming more vengeful, and it's only adding to Hannah's turmoil. Hannah is dreadfully alone. And I have to ask, you know, have, have you ever been there in a season of unyielding sorrow and affliction and you find yourself surrounded by so many people seemingly untouched by troubles and wholly unsensing of your woe and perhaps totally unable to comfort you? You're grieved to the core with more questions than answers. Have you ever been in a season where sometimes it's difficult for you to even come to church because your sorrow is so mentally and physically debilitating? That's where Hannah is. And she pours out all of her tears and her desires to God. And the affliction of this comfortless woman has driven her right into her father's everlasting arms. In verse 9, we read, After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. Hannah was bitterly distressed, deeply distressed, and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And here is what she prays and vows. There's only one sentence recorded here, but it's full of meaning. Verse 11, and she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, 
but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. Hannah starts her prayer with acknowledging that God is the Lord of hosts. If you're like me, you probably glossed right over that title, Lord of hosts. I think Kyle used a term in his message called semantic satiation. Lord of hosts is one of those terms. It's used 260 times in the Old Testament. But interestingly, it's the second time it's ever used right in this verse. And the first time it's used is back in verse 3 of this chapter. So the first two times Lord of hosts is ever used is right in our chapter. This term is developed around the period of Judges, and it comes to mean that God is the supreme deity who controls everything on heaven and earth. Hannah is acknowledging God's universal sovereignty and unlimited power. But then she moves on using the phrase, your servant, three times. Look on your servant. Remember your servant. Give to your servant. At once, she is stating that the God who intervenes sovereignly in the affairs of all the world is also interested in this little handmaiden's life. He isn't too busy to involve little people in his plans. He is a God who can intervene. He is a God who can give her a son. And Hannah's prayer is not bent on any sort of personal pride or revenge. She begs of the Lord for a son so that she can dedicate him to his service. Her prayer takes the form of a vow. It's not a bargain with God. This is a woman who knows that if she has a son, it's a miracle from God. And she's going to see to it that her son will serve God for all of his days and that he would be specially set apart as a Nazarite. And as Hannah is in the full opus of her prayer, in verses 12 through 16, we have Eli the priest. Remember, he was hanging out, the, out at the post um, at the temple. We have, we have him, and he's watching Hannah. He's watching her move her mouth in prayer. He's watching her weep, but he doesn't hear any words coming out of her mouth. And indignantly, he bursts into the scene, and he accuses Hannah of being drunk. I thought, you know, Eli, that's, that's quite a stretch. Here this woman is praying, and you think she's drunk. I get the impression that perhaps Eli encountered the occasional drunkard stumbling in from the feast. But I like that Eli is quickly softened by Hannah's explanation that she was not drunk, but that she was simply pouring out her grief and her complaint to the Lord. A few years ago, Dave Shive taught at the family retreat on Psalm 40, if you guys remember that. And he taught verse by verse. But verse 1 was, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. And Dave's question was, how can you wait patiently on the Lord and be complaining and be grieving and be crying? How do those two make sense? But what we have here is as Hannah is pouring out her grief, she's pouring out her complaint. The Lord is drawing near, just like Psalm 40 says. 1 Peter 5, 7 says to cast your cares on the Lord, for he cares for you. And that's what we are to do with our cares. It's all right if we pour out our grief and complaint before the Lord. So then we look at verse 17. Eli answers, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. 
And she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Isn't it amazing what happens when you lay out your cares to God and trust yourself into his hands? All of the burdens and fears and anxieties that hold you hostage, they release their grip. You stop looking to your circumstances as a gauge for your well-being. You find yourself saying, my God can deliver me from this trouble, but even if he doesn't, I'm still going to praise him. Eli doesn't tell Hannah that her prayer is answered. He doesn't prophesy to her. He simply blesses her like a benediction, like, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. I think that Hannah went her way and ate and was no longer sad because in that moment, she placed the direction of her life in God's sovereign hands. Her heart was one that could say, may it be done to me according to your will. We could end the message there, couldn't we? Wrestling and grief and finally sweet surrender to God's plans for our lives, whether we like the outcome or not. But fortunately for Hannah, it doesn't end there. God goes on to do amazing things. Hannah and her husband don't stick around in Shiloh for very long. Verse 19 says that they leave the next morning, and when they return home, they're intimate with each other. Perhaps these verses mean that Hannah was ready to believe that she could have a child, and she was quick to show her faith by her actions. And of course, there's nothing wrong with that interpretation. But I also think as she surrendered her grief and her pain to the Lord, she actually came to enjoy her life with her husband in a new and intimate way, regardless of whether or not they could have children. There was a healing in their marriage. There was joy and forgiveness and restoration. I like to think that God healed their marriage and brought peace in their home because he loved them. And it would be the start of a good home life to nurture Israel's next and great leader. Because then in verse 20, we learn, in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. And she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. We go on to learn that Hannah finishes weaning Samuel. She keeps her vow, and she takes Samuel back to Shiloh with a rather rich offering, three bulls, an ephah of flour, a skin of wine, and Elkanah and she make the sacrifices together. This is a marriage that God has reunited, and look at them serve together. They're making the sacrifice together. They're bringing Samuel before Eli together. They're honoring Hannah's vow together. They're worshiping together, and they're rejoicing together. And then verse 26 Hannah, in speaking to Eli, says, O oh, my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who was standing here in your presence, praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. I am utterly amazed by the richness of Hannah's response to God's blessing by lending Samuel to the Lord. This meant that Samuel would live at the temple with Eli and be raised to serve God in a special way. Hannah would not have a normal mother's life. Yet, in dedicating her son to the Lord and having to depart from him, she's not sorrowful. Actually, her heart is bursting forth with prophecy and praise, 
and she declares a new song so great that it is memorialized in Scripture for, for all posterity and almost a thousand years later is referenced by Mary, the expectant mother of Jesus. As we stand here today, her words are about 3,000 years old, and we're getting ready to quote them. I think that's pretty impressive. So let's look at chapter 2. And I didn't, it's so long, I'm just going to read it. I didn't put it up on the slide, so if you want to turn there. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord. There is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken but the feeble bind on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness, for not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces, Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. If you look at the first three verses, it's basically saying this. There is none like the Lord. There is none stronger than him. Do not boast in your strength. If you look at verses 4 through 8, you get the point that God is sovereign over the affairs of everyone. He accomplishes all of his purposes. He even intervenes on behalf of the downtrodden and forgotten to transform their circumstances. And I love this. Look a little more closely at verses 4 through 8. The weak are made strong. The hungry and thirsty are satisfied. The dead are brought to life. The poor inherit the earth. The mourners are comforted. The lowly are exalted. These are characteristics that describe more fully the future Messiah and the sort of complete salvation he will bring to those who trust him. It's no wonder that Mary's Magnificat in Luke mirrors so closely Hannah's song. And I'm just going to put it up there so you can take a look at it. God chose Mary, his humble maidservant, to give birth to Jesus, the light of the world, the Messiah, the everlasting Savior. God chose the low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. And in looking at verses 9 through 10, Hannah declares that God will save his people, destroy their adversaries, judge the earth, and establish his anointed king. And Hannah is correct. Israel did transition to a king, and eventually after a time it was King David. And it is David who is given the promise that the Messiah is going to come from his line, a Messiah who would preach the gospel to the poor, proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. The good news is that the anointed king has come, King Jesus. He conquered sin and the power of death. 
and he will return again to judge the earth and to bring his people home to him. Our God is a God who intervenes in our darkness, hears the cries of our hearts, and is faithful to deliver us from the oppression of sin. If you are broken, if you are hurting, if you are lonely, if your circumstances like Hannah's are just too much for you to bear, cry out to him. Jesus is calling you to lay down your burdens and to follow him. He wants you to trust him in his sovereign direction in your life. If you have not made the decision to follow Christ, today is the day of salvation. Do not wait. Come and be satisfied. Let the Lord begin to heal your heart and put a new song in your mouth. I'd like to go ahead and pray to close us out today, and then we'll all be dismissed. Lord, thank you for the timeliness of your salvation. Thank you that you intervene in our lives, God. Thank you that it is your desire to save your people. Lord, I pray that as we draw close to you and as we trust you, Lord, that you would incline yourself to us. Father, I pray that this word today would resonate in each of our hearts and that tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day, we'd be encouraged to develop more and more our walk in relationship with you, to talk more freely with you, Lord, and to give you the burdens of our hearts. Thank you for opening this word to us. We thank you, Jesus, and we ask for your blessing as we're dismissed. In Jesus' name, amen.